Hey, welcome to episode 133 of the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to Clive Barker and the works that surround his stuff. This is a news episode, um, and we talk in this uh, news about Hellraiser Judgment, uh, the upcoming Hellraiser sequel. We talk quite a bit about that. Uh, we talk about the, um, the the new arrival of the, the anniversary edition of The Thief of Always, uh, a screening of Hellraiser 3 with a Q&A with the director, Anthony Hickox, and we talk about uh, Fangoria. Uh, Tony Todd was nominated for a Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, the, the Real Fear promo, uh, and you can get tortured, the Tortured Souls book uh, in a bundle of books for only fifteen dollars. Um, so all of that plus what's coming, what's going on with with us and the Kickstarter. And I do just want to say really quick, our Kickstarter is almost over. You you can contribute if you want to help us out, but you can also contribute just if you want to get cool stuff. Uh, we've got an awesome poster that you can't get anywhere else. We've got a hardcover book of our interviews. Um, that is uh, going to be night be- nightbreed related, and you you know that's that's a special thing that we're making that you won't be able to get anywhere else. And uh, the T-shirt, you know, we need to sell some more T-shirts, like you heard in our last episode. Okay, so here we are, episode one hundred and thirty-three. Our Kickstarter, we we did it. We actually did a bonus episode number one thirty-two. Um, mm-hmm. Sorry if we're a little bit obnoxious, but our Kickstarter only had four days left, and uh, and right now it's at seventy two hours as we're recording this. And I'll try to get this posted up um, in advance of the end of our of our fundraiser, so that uh, so that people hearing this will have a little bit more time to to get those those last minute um, books and t shirts. Yes, buy the t shirt. That's the yeah. name of our episode yeah. one thirty two. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, uh, looking good. I mean, I'm very happy the way the Kickstarter is going. Um, uh, yeah. we didn't really do a lot of promotion around the internet. So this is, uh, yeah. excellent that on the second year of our Kickstarter, we're getting more money than last year and we're also offering more ambitious goals. And so that's cool. I'm, I'm really happy with the way this is going. Um, we might start bugging people a little more in these last few hours here. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. We got after our last episode, we got one more pledge for a dollar. So oh, okay, yeah. that's that's not bad. Yeah. Every dollar counts, people. Well, and actually, something that we haven't we haven't really promoted a whole lot, but if you anybody that does any bit at all is going to get an ebook version of our of our um, of our interview book. interview book. Yeah, so you know that guy is smart. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, this is so. This is the big one. Um, there was an there was a podcast. There's a podcast called Sixty Minutes Sixty Minutes with, and this episode was Sixty Minutes with Gary Tunnicliffe, which was actually three three hours and ten minutes. Wow. Um, yeah. Did you did you end up listening to the whole thing? I have not yet listened to the whole thing. I've listened to maybe about an hour of it, and yeah. um, at the beginning, it starts. It's it's very like chronological. It goes through. They ask him, "What's your career been like? You know, can yeah. you tell us where Gary J. Tunnicliffe is coming from, where he's going, blah blah blah." And he goes like, "Oh well, you know, I was a kid, blah 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 blah." And I was like, "Oh my god, yeah. this is going to start at the very beginning." And he was watching Hammer films at night, and he started thinking about you know wanting to do movies and being an actor. And then his dad said, "No way, you're going to be a homosexual." Yeah. And, yeah. And then he saw Fangoria once at some friend's house and that's when he decided that hey, I want to do makeup effects. Yeah. Which I guess is true for a lot of people out there. I mean, I remember my first Fangoria kind of blew my mind. I was like, "Holy crap, this magazine is awesome." Yeah. I remember seeing it in in uh, kids' bedrooms on movies. You know, mm, in the 80s yeah. and thinking, "Man, those are so cool, but my parents would never let me get those." Yeah. I only started reading those because i had to get them imported in portugal so oh, wow. yeah but uh yeah there was some interesting stuff about his career i didn't know that uh he headed the u.s division of image animation and he only left it so that he could come back to england and do and do the the special effects for um hellraiser bloodline yeah i knew that um i think they mentioned something about it on leviathan as well yeah um but then he kind of splintered off, and yeah, I think right. he's 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 okay with Bob Keen and those people. So um, yeah, and he was explaining how he ended up doing that. And um, I think you said that uh, 
he was already apologizing a little bit in the podcast about yeah. Hellraiser Judgment. Yeah, well, and an interesting thing about the, how Hellraiser Judgment started, they, they had asked him, uh, he, he had wanted to do a script for Hellraiser Judgment, and they, they asked him to do one, and he wrote this script. He, he, did, he did an entire script that was so, like, formulaic and exactly, you know, what you would expect from a Hellraiser sequel these days. It had, like, a house and, and like, a, a professor or somebody and, like, all these grad students. And it's just, like, one of the ones that we talked about, actually, on, our, uh, on one of our, our uh, Duels of Blood episodes. And, right, right. Yeah, and, and he, 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 he presented that to them, and they said, we love it. And he said, okay. This is the script I wrote, but this is not the script I'm going to do. I'm going to do this one. And he handed them judgment. Oh, and, okay. And they, and they were like, what, no, you know, we want this other one. And he said, no, I'll do, I'll do this other one. I'm going to write this other script. And if you don't like it, I'll do the first movie. But I think you're going to like this one. Okay, I guess he pulled a bait and switch. Yeah, and they said, and I'll write them. I'll write this one for free. So it's like you only have to pay me for one script. And so, so he had already written the previous one, right? The yeah. Hellraiser 9 uh, yeah. Revelations. Yes, yeah, exactly. Which um, he talked a little bit about that one too. And, and uh, he said, you know, he, he he blames the director for that mm-hmm. movie. But I think the there's Garcia a lot, dude. Yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff wrong with that. I mean, the budget, the, the casting, the budget yeah. and the casting are, are, are also really bad. Some of the writing I also don't like, but I think mostly it's the budget and the casting. Yeah, the the, the lighting is flat, and you yeah. know the parents and the kids are look like they're almost the same age and all <laughs> yeah. that. So yeah, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, I could tell that the story was not entirely bad, but uh, yeah, I also didn't think it added anything new or original, um, oh. except for that weird pseudo pinhead and stuff. So yeah. So he said that people blame him for that, and he gets death threats and stuff like that. And oh, he started shucks. he started talking about Hellraiser Judgment and and writing this script. They kept giving him notes and rewrites and stuff. And he rewrote the script like five times. And he's like, "Yeah, I mean, I know that what I wrote originally was good, and you know, and 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 that at the end, you know, when this movie comes out, there's going to be people that hate me and are going. I'm going to get beat up on my way home, and and." <laughs> And he said that I know the internet's going to rape me and stuff like that. And so he's already kind of distancing himself from it, which is really scary because the movie's not out yet. Yeah, and um, like you said, he worked in Hellraiser 3 uh, when he did that. You can definitely tell that the makeup of uh, Pinhead's makeup on Hellraiser 3 is a little different from Hellraiser yeah. 2. Oh, yeah. 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 It's, it's a different color and stuff. But um, so he also worked on Lord of Illusions. And um, apparently Doug Bradley asked him <laughs> when he was telling them about Hellraiser Judgment, um, why are you helping those assholes make another movie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he was like, oh, th- this was a terrible way to start out because, you know, he's like, I'm all excited about this movie. I'm, I'm talking to Doug about it. I'm wanting him to get excited, too. He's like, I want everybody involved in this project to get excited. And this is how Doug Bradley starts out. And he's, you know, Doug is surly i mean i think he might have expected something like that sure i think doug was also a little like from what you can tell when you read his interviews and stuff when gary did a short fo- a short film where he played penhead once called oh, no, no more, more souls. souls yeah and i think that in his book doug bradley mentions when he did Hellraiser three that he had to do that scene with spencer elliot spencer and pinhead so they had to get another guy dressed as pinhead and he thought that was really weird for him because he was like, I didn't like seeing someone else using my makeup. It felt like that's oh, my character. Yeah. And then when No More Souls came out, he was also a little pissed. I think he used the word pissed when yeah. he said, well, I was a little pissed to see like Gary play Pinhead. But, you know, we've spoken and, you know, I'm just paraphrasing. But he said, we've spoken about it and we're good. But, yeah, I think after Revelations, Doug Bradley really kind of just decided that I'm not going to do it. It's... You know, yeah. uh, he, he may feel a little betrayed, you know, that, they, yeah. that they would. And, and I think, I think he's right. I mean, I honestly, I think that fine. If you want to make a Hellraiser movie, don't put Pinhead in it. Put, put other Cenobites. 
Yeah, I know. I mean, it's it feel it sounds a little like impossible because you yeah. know that there's always going to be fans. A big yeah. segment of the fans are going to be like, "Oh, well, this is Hellraiser. It doesn't have any pinhead on it. Oh, it yeah. doesn't have the box." But, but, um, but it's not yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street. You can make it. I mean, it's the the Hellraiser is a lot about the mystery of this this world that these creatures come from and and this strange system where you open a puzzle box and you get dragged to, into hell and and I think you and you know. Like Phantasm, they could have made Phantasm movies without the tall man. Mm. But sure, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, you expect him to be there, but but it, he doesn't it, have to. Yeah, he doesn't have to be, and I think it's the same with Hellraiser. I mean, I think you can respect the whole universe and respect Doug, Doug yeah. Bradley by not casting somebody else as as Pinhead. Right. I mean, I, I I really enjoyed seeing an expansion of the mythology when I was reading the Scarlet Gospels, even though, okay, Pinhead is there. But Pinhead, to me, when I was reading the Scarlet Gospels, and I'm going to be honest here, he was not the character that – or he was not what was making the book work for me. What was making the book work for me was Harry Moore and the whole hell landscape thing and all yeah. that, the monumental stuff, you know, oh, yeah, and, and, and Yeah, and uh, the, the, the unconsumed and Lucifer – yeah, Pinhead yeah. has some really cool moments, but uh, there's also a lot more characters in there that I thought were more interesting than Pinhead. Pinhead is kind of like, yeah, he's in there, but he's like, uh, he has some cool moments, but most most of them, he's just walking around. He's just, yeah. he's just, you know, working his plan. But um, well, but yeah, he, like you said, he's kind of also turned into a real sort of bastard, you know, in in the Scarlet yeah. Gospels, where I yeah. think he was sort of impartial and and you know dispassionate. In the mm-hmm. in the first Hellraiser movie and and probably in uh, and in the the Hellbound Heart, but he had kind of become what Clive Barker didn't like about the Hellraiser sequels. I think it was like his his um, it was Clive Barker's statement about where the character has gone. Absolutely, he wanted to finish the character in his own terms. But yeah. going back to like the Tunnicliffe's uh, interview, he also complained about you know the reaction that Doug Bradley had to a very standard non-disclosure agreement. And yeah. you know it's true that Doug Bradley kind of went on a few interviews, but he didn't go out of his way to say this this stuff. But it was more like people were asking him about it, obviously, yeah. because people wanted to know why are you not in this Hellraiser, and he would explain that well. You know, um, Gary had a script and he sent it to me. But before he would send it to me, he wanted me to sign this non-disclosure agreement. You know, and he didn't like, I guess, the wording of it. We've well, we've been through this several and he, times. Yeah, and he described the way he, that Doug Bradley describes the NDA. He made it sound like Gary or somebody just wrote it themselves and put all this crazy language like you can't talk about it in an elevator, you can't talk about it in the bathroom. In the bathroom, But yeah. they didn't spell out like you can't talk about it at all. So it's kind of like he said it was amateurish, and he said, and then, uh, but then you go back to this interview, and he's like, it was a standard NDA that they probably used for all their movies, and yeah. uh, and uh, Doug Bradley didn't like it. And, um, and uh, was it, he, he said, uh, oh, now I lost my train of thought. He he said that he wasn't going to sign a non-disclosure agreement to read a fucking script, yeah. and then, and then Gary said, "Well, it was my fucking script." Yeah. <laughs> so I think he got a little. They both got a little like hurt at each other, I guess. Yeah. I'm not, I, I mean, I don't know. For all I know, they could be good friends, but I just got this this vibe that things are kind of cold between Doug Bradley returning to Hellraiser and you know Gary Tunnicliffe trying to make his statement by directing and writing his own movie and making the effects for it and all that. But I got a larger, you know, I got a more, I I became more sympathetic towards Gary Tunnicliffe after I listened to most of this interview. Yeah. Uh, I didn't listen to the whole thing, but I'm still working through it. But, you know, he's, he's a very creative guy and he just, he really wanted to, you know, make a, a career for himself in special effects. And I think now he's actually thinking about, you know, he, he was saying at one point that he's happy with the, you know, the the place that he got to in his career and and maybe he would like to do something else now. And I was yeah. like, oh, wow. He sounded yeah. like he was going to start a, he was going to get into a band and just start being a musician again. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. I mean, that's always, that's always been kind of like a, a strategy that I think a lot of people have, it's like, well, I would like to be successful at something and make enough money so that I can, like, live comfortably the rest of my life, yeah. you know, from, like, interest or something. Unfortunately, it's like 
you know, the, the, the interest rates have been terrible. So yeah. uh, maybe when they go up a little more, more yeah. people will be able to do what they love instead yeah. of having to continue working for all these years. But uh, Well, it's so, yeah. interesting for yeah. Hellraiser fans to kind of get a, a, a peek behind the scenes, but I think – I think that it was probably a mistake for him to, uh, you know, just, just start distancing himself and saying it's not my fault when we haven't even seen the movie yet. I mean, yeah, I, that seems a little, you know, that seems a little like uh, preemptive. I, I've always had this sort of little glimmer of, well, there's always a chance that it could be, it's low budget, but there's always this chance that it could be really interesting and do some cool stuff. Yeah, and right. I we, mean, we never know. I mean, we don't have. Sure. I mean, I, I don't. I, I'm not. You know, betting money on it or anything. But I, you know, mm-hmm. there's always a chance. But now it's kind of like, oh, well, now you're not happy with it, and you think that they took all the that they took the some of the good stuff out that you put in. Yeah, and that's yeah, not so. a, even a guarantee that it, that his version would have been good either. But we don't. You know, we don't know. Well, a lot of people connected to Clive Barker, they always thought that Hellraiser was going to be a trilogy. And even though I, I still consider the, the good part of the franchise is up to four, and then after four, it just it, it doesn't yeah. really appeal to me anymore. And once I, I keep saying this, video, yeah. yeah. After I, you know, after I, after a while, I started becoming a little more disappointed with every single sequel, and I felt like that affected my 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 fandom somewhat of hellraiser my hellraiser fandom was being a little affected by the bad sequels Mm -hmm. the thing that really brought me back into liking hellraiser was leviathan you know the documentary yeah yeah i know what you mean so we were starting to get a little burned out on hellraiser you know because oh yeah it's such a it's it's such a small part of clive barker's output but it's such a huge part of the commute the fan community and stuff Sure, sure. Yeah. So, yeah, thank goodness for Leviathan because the history of Hell, Hellraiser and Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, that was the, the documentary that brought me back a little more into the Hellraiser fandom. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, Gary Gary T., I mean, I keep saying this, you know, I don't think anybody sets out to make a bad movie, so I'll give it a chance. But it's like, yeah. you know, after it's distanced itself so much from Clive Barker at this point that I just don't really feel like, you know, like a Clyde Barker fan, I really don't feel that much interest in Hellraiser. But I'm just speaking in my own personal opinion and my personal experience. So maybe out there's plenty of people out there who are discovering Hellraiser every day. And they're going through all the movies and they're like, oh, man, this is so cool. I want more. So, hey, I'm happy that there's going to be more for these people. Yeah. Well, and when this interview was uh, was reported, there was some news. I don't remember which news outlet it was, but their headline was like, there may be a theatrical release of Hellraiser Judgment. And it's like, well, first of all, we already reported that based on on uh, Paul T. Taylor's Facebook post. Yeah. But second, if you, you listen to the entire three hours of this movie, the only thing he says about the release is, I have no clue what they're going to do. They might do re- theatrical, they might do video, they might just do streaming. And I don't know what I don't know how it's going to be released, and I don't know when they're going to release it. But it's probably sometime in 2017. Mm-hmm. So it's well, like that. That was a really misleading story. I mean, and and I think that uh, I think that there's more interesting stuff in this interview than than what uh, what was reported on the news. Oh story. yeah, 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 absolutely. Even if you don't care that much about Hellraiser, you can still listen to this interview if you like to hear about horror movies and makeup effects, and if you if you like Gary Tunnicliffe's work, which is pretty good. And if it does get a theatrical release, then I suppose we're going to see the movie long before we ever get to do a commentary on it. Yeah. So yeah. maybe we would make a podcast episode about the movie. So, hey, there's always going to be a, you know, um, what do you, um, a return to like, oh, let me, let me, let me redo this. Okay. Um, well, I'm trying to come up with a word, a rebirth. Okay. Never mind. I'm going to rewind Revival. this. Yeah. After a sequel comes out, there's always going to be a revival of, you know, the Hellraiser fandom. It's it's something that happens every time. Even with Revelations, there were people who were, like, posting stuff and discussing it and saying, well, the story's not that bad, you know, hey. Yeah. So you never know. I mean, it, it, every time that the Hellraiser fandom gets revived a little bit, there's more stuff that comes out. There's more discussion that, you know, the fans do, which is pretty good. And, you know... There's one step closer to maybe doing something better with Hellraiser, 
For example, we've Clyde Barker's people, you know, Seraphim, they're working on that Hellraiser anthology graphic novel. Yeah. And um, the, the, uh, we, the Scarlet Box made its way over to the United States. Exactly. So yeah. there's always good things that happen uh, when interest is revived in, in a franchise like this. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that Hellraiser anthology in the future. But, uh, gosh, have you read it yet? The the uh, anthology? No, no, I haven't. Okay. No, I really okay. haven't. Yeah, I, I, I was just focusing on, on uh, preparing for our next couple of episodes here, but... Sure I really thing. need to do that. Yeah, we were lucky enough to get a copy, an advanced copy. So I've I've been reading it, and I I thought it was amazing. I mean, it's, if they just capture that anthology feel from like the old Marvel comics from the nineties. Really? Have yes. You, have you read the entire thing? I've read the entire thing. Did, I've read how, it. How like, did it compare to Hellraiser Bestiary? I mean, we're going <laughs> to talk in depth. We're going to have a whole in depth episode about this, but just sure, it's very similar to Hellraiser Bestiary. Okay. It's very similar in tone, except it takes more chances and there's more stuff in there that probably wouldn't make it in the Boom comics. Oh, wow. So, okay. Yeah, there's there's a lot more sex. There's a lot more, like, um, th- there's violence. Well, violence, you know, it's not a problem in, in American society. <laughs> yeah. But but the sex seems to be a, a problem and nudity. And this one has – it can go that way because it's not limited to, you know, uh, market – or an editor, or, you know, they offending people. So they they just they put some stuff in there that's pretty gruesome. Wow! But um, used in a way that's very appropriate for Hellraiser. I mean, I, I always thought that Hellraiser should take risks and and go an extra mile to push beyond the limits, right? I mean, that's yeah. what Hellraiser is about. Like its original tagline was, "There are no limits." So I think that this Hellraiser anthology goes places that they wouldn't go in a how should I say, in, in, in a, a comic book published by uh, a publishing company, you know, because there's always there's always a certain degree of freedom that that they have. But, you know, I mean, in terms of nudity, uh, sometimes they don't go too far. And I think this one goes that extra mile and uses it really well. Wow. And so I'm, I liked it. Yeah. Well, that's that's a really good teaser for for uh, for that. Mm hmm. Yes. And- yes. And uh, speaking of revivals, the the uh, Thief of Always 25th Anniversary Edition uh, has shipped, and in fact, um, you and I have got a copy of it. Yes, we we were lucky enough to get a copy of the deluxe. Yeah. And wow, I mean, I did that unboxing slash review video for Barkercast channel on YouTube. And I just loved it so much. I was just looking at that book for like three days until I had to pack it because I'm moving to oh, a new yeah. house. But yeah. uh, so I don't have it with me right now. It's packed really nicely in in, in the box that it came in. But uh, I love that book. That book is so beautiful. It is. It is. Yeah. And we'll we'll we're gonna ne- for next week we're gonna have a whole episode about it. You know that and uh, and Infernal Parade. But um, but it, it was amazing. And I think. You know, I couldn't have afforded that, and and I have I can't say thank you enough to Seraphim for for giving that uh, giving that to us to review. Uh, oh yeah, Clive Barker and Seraphim yeah. for sure. Thank you guys for for sending this our way, and I hope we we did it justice by uh, yeah. by reviewing it like we did. And d- does it make us biased to get free copies of the? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> I you know, but but I love it. It's it's an amazing book, and and I think that uh, the Thief of Always for a lot of Clive Barker fans probably has a really special place in our in our collection in our hearts. Oh, it certainly does for me. Yeah. I mean, I remember reading this in the early nineties, um, and I loved it. It was the first time I saw Clive Barker do something that wasn't, um, you know, strictly horror. I mean. I started reading the Books of Blood, and then I think I graduated to Cabal, and then I think I read The Great and Secret Show, and I think Thief of Always was the next one that I read. So, I, you know, this it's a beautiful story. It, if you like Harry Potter, if you like Peter Pan, if you like, you know, fantasy uh, for young adults, this this book is for you. I mean, it, it became it became something that is studied in schools. Um, just like Aberat, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah twenty five years. It's Beautiful an amazing book, book and and uh, Clive Barker sold it to the publisher for only a dollar, just because it was an important book to him and he wanted it out there. He got a silver dollar out of this deal. Yeah, he did. It yeah. was an actual silver dollar that he got. So. Yeah. 
Um, so there is, uh, speaking of Hellraiser revivals again, there's a screening of Hellraiser 3 in Florida with a Q&A with Anthony Hickox. So I don't, that seems pretty rare. I don't know that I've ever heard of that happening before. Have you? Um, no, I haven't. I mean, especially not with Anthony Hickox. Um, yeah. So that's that's interesting because this was the, the, the movie that really broke uh, Hellraiser to the American audience, I guess. Yeah, and this was uh, this, so. This is m- Thursday, March second at nine p.m. at the. Uh... Let me see, Cinema <laughs> Winwood, Thursday, March second at nine p.m. Yes, yeah, film I'm festival. sorry, Popcorn Frights Film Festival. It's that that's really cool. If I was anywhere near Florida, I would be headed to that just because I think that's a cool Clive Barker sort of tangential related event. Ask Anthony Hickox uh, about that uh, line where Doug Bradley says, "Unbound, unstoppable." He says that, you know, does he just really? listen to it. Yes, he does. Yeah. Uh, he as, th- uh, as, as not as Pinhead, but as Elliot Spencer, right? Yes. Instead of unstoppable, he says unstoppable. So that <laughs> they left that in the movie. You know, oh. you can go and, and, and watch it and uh, you'll see. Is that something that, that Doug Bradley pointed out? I bet that is. Yeah, I yeah. think he did. He did that. that sounds that like something he would uh, in his forum. <laughs> and I think he did a, a take that was correct. But then, unfortunately, in editing, they they. I guess they didn't notice, and they used the take where he says, unstoppable. Uh, it's funny. Oh, yeah. man. That's great. Yeah, I, I wonder who the editor was for that. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know the name by heart right now. But, oh, uh, um, go, sorry. Oh. Going back to hell, going back to the uh, – that reminded me. Going back to the Gary Tunnicliffe interview, he talked about uh, one of his favorite moments – was working on Hellraiser 3 because he said Clive Barker was doing directing second unit and so mm-hmm. he was doing he was doing special effects getting getting you know uh direction from Clive Barker so he's like I'm this his dream had come true he was working on a Hellraiser movie uh being directed by Clive Barker Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. I wonder if he did effects for that uh, uh Hellraiser music video with Lemmy and Pinhead Oh <laughs> yeah I think cuz yeah I think he did it was done I think at the they time. talked about yeah. it Yeah okay and, and probably that scene where uh, where she's all trussed up and hanging by that chain, and and Pinhead and Elliot Spencer are arguing in front of in front of uh, Joey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was um, wasn't that like a, a, a an a additional shoot that he did with yeah. Clive Barker, right? Clive Barker said that they should put uh, Joey in bondage, and then he s- suggested that weird machine coming out of the floor Yeah, yeah. in Hellraiser 3. So I think that was a Clive idea there. Um, so Fangoria is nominating Tony Todd for a Lifetime Achievement Award. Yeah, well, that's cool. He deserves it. Yeah, he's played Candyman in three movies, and he's been in The Crow and a bunch of other movies. So it's always nice to see Tony Todd getting some recognition there. Have you seen stuff online saying that like Fangoria might be going out of business or they might be no, shutting but down? no. The thing is that they 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 stopped doing uh, paper uh, paper issues oh. right some time ago, yeah. I think. Well, and and their website, I, I never really cared much for their website. I really liked their magazine though. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, same here. Well, yeah. you know, that's it's the age of digital yeah. magazines, and um, so I guess it. it at some point, the costs don't make up for the return. So eventually, I think they, they're going to go digital. Well, it would be cool if they could just make the same magazine but in digital, you know, instead of just saying, well, now everything's on our website because that's not the same. Sure. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do, but uh, I guess we'll find out. Yeah. Well, and they were talking. we were talking earlier about Arrow's Scarlet Go- Box coming over to the U.S. Well, it's sold out at Amazon.com already. So that's kind of a shame. That's too bad. I mean, I think that uh, maybe they underestimated the market for it because it hasn't been that long. Yeah, I think that uh, – but it, it's been for sale for a few months in Amazon, I think. It wasn't too bad. I mean, the, the, it came out like in November, I think. Wasn't it November of last year? Yeah, yeah, right. Something like that. Or, uh, and Yes, I think it was – or December. Or December? Because I, anyway, I know I got it right before Christmas. Right, I got it for Christmas. Um, yeah. The thing is, it's not sold out. It's sold out on Amazon.com. It means that the material that they had set aside for Amazon yeah. finally sold out, which is a good sign. It means that there's a lot of people out there who are buying this wonderful set. 
And when we were following this sort of thing with uh, Nightbreed Director's Cut, we um, when it sold out on Amazon, we're like, hey, you can still get it on like Diabolic DVD, and there were other places to still find them uh, before they sure. sell- sold out completely. Sure. So I, I have my Scarlet Box. I love it. And yeah. um, uh, I guess we'll have to do a review of that. I mean, our, yeah. uh, Rob already did a review of the original uh, run of the British Scarlet Box. Yeah. So because he had why a we haven't region. focused on it so much. But you know, and yes. I have it too. And I haven't watched any of the movies yet. It's sitting on my on my to do video shelf. We're ready. Gosh, to we've been watched. so busy with the podcast. Really, yeah. I mean, I, like I said, we did that hangout. Um, on Tuesday, and then we're doing this show on a Thursday, and we're going to do the next show right after this for <laughs> next week. Yeah. And I've been working on that Road to the Scarlet Gospels, which is clocking in at about 13,000 words, maybe. And, you and just I'm doing another Let's Play video for Undying. Yes. And also, I'm doing uh, a celebration post for Nightbreed because it's today, February 16th. When we're recording this, it's the 27th anniversary of Nightbreed, uh, released in the U.S. Wow. And my article for that Nightbreed, you know, celebration is already clocking in at 8,500 words. So, <laughs> okay. I know. Yeah. I know. I mean, I gave you that first draft this morning. So. Yeah, that had small print. I, yeah. I woke up. Jennifer called me about something, and I had just woken up, and then I saw that on my phone, and I was like, my eyes were kind of bleary, and I'm like, oh, that's small print on for my phone. I know. Sorry. It's I. Whenever I write something about Clyde Barker or some movies, I start getting really, really into the details, and I oh, start yeah. writing and writing and writing. And then sometimes I feel like, oh, I need to put this aside a little bit. So I know that the Scarlet Gospels uh, article has been in the in in you know in line to get published for a while, but it's just it's really hard. But the part one, I promise you guys, it's coming out. If not today, then tomorrow. Oh wow! And 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 I I just need to finish the ending of the first part. So, and the Nightbreed article is going to come out today, and it's going to be really informative. It's going to have a lot of like links. It's going to mention a lot of our f- early episodes. It's going to mention a lot of interviews with Mark Miller and That's Michael cool. Plumides and Russell Charrington and Jimmy Johnson. So I, I'm trying to – maybe we'll end up putting this in the interview book as an intro. So oh. who knows? Yeah, that would be great. I think, Yeah, uh, you can think work on that too. It's a pretty comprehensive, uh, neat history of, of Nightbreed and, and its uh, releases and stuff. Yeah, I think it's good to catch – You know, uh, Revelations has an awesome website. They always have like the all the information there. But sometimes there's things that only we know uh, because we were in Occupy Midian. And so we, we have this insight that I think it's worth putting down into letters and words and and come up with some sort of our own version of what happened. So, um, yeah. Uh, real fear. Uh, that, that we, t- we talked about this before, but it's that, uh, that thing that, that's with, um, with Clive Barker Shutter and Shudder. And Project Greenlight. Yeah. Um, so that, that uh, sort of reality show, develop a horror movie project, has a, a promo video. And, you know, instead of describing all the rules, I'll just, I'll, we'll just play that into the video. You know, we'll edit that in right now. So. Partnership with Project Greenlight Digital Studios and Shudder, Clive Barker presents the real fear for contents. We're on the hunt for the most sinister, the most frightening, the most original, never before seen horror ideas. And we want them from people like you. <laughs> Your time starts now, and you have until March 17th to visit Project Greenlight.com slash contests and upload your pitch video outlining the eerie details of your very own horror film. Do not miss this opportunity and do not break the rules. 
Do not let your pitch go over three minutes. Do not miss the submission deadline, March 17th, 2017. Do not pitch an idea that is not your own material. Stay with me. I knew you would be. So what's in it for you? Ten semi-finalists will be selected to interview with a panel of judges from Project Greenlight Digital Studios, Shutter, and of course, Clive Barker. Those ten video pitches will be subject to a community vote. The submission with the most votes will move into the top five, along with four other entries selected by the judges. The five finalists will receive $2,000 each to shoot a pre-written scene and will be granted a fellowship with Shudder in June that will help them enhance their submission. This four-day Shudder Labs retreat is dedicated to giving emerging filmmakers guidance from established mentors in the horror community. After completion, a winner will be selected by the panel of judges and given $300,000 to develop his or her own film. I can feel the strangeness creeping into your minds already. <laughs> yeah, there. So there it was. <laughs> so that that pretty well lays out all the rules for the contest. This kind of a neat uh, a neat thing. I think I was the only one that had reported uh, from a Craigslist ad that they posted that they were looking for extras for that. So that was all the little people in the audience that were turning into zombies and stuff were those extras, presumably, from that Craigslist Oh, ad. interesting. Interesting, yeah. Uh, so it's it, it's a little complicated, but I think the video did a good job of explaining what it is. And yeah. I'm looking forward to see how this is going to evolve. I don't have Shudder, though. I mean, do you have Shudder? No. No, I, I, guess... just, I just shut down Netflix just to save money. So I'm... <laughs> Maybe it's a good time to get into Shutter. I, I know I looked at it once and I was like, "Oh, this sounds like a cool like network kind of thing." Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Shutter and Project Greenlight with Clive Barker. So watch out for real fear. Yeah, that sounds fun. Um, Tortured Souls is included in uh, Subterranean's Humble Bundle for fifteen dollars. So this was something I just noticed today on on uh, on the uh, Revelations. Facebook page, you know, not cool. the, not not uh, Hellraiser revelations, but you know, Phil and Sarah Stokes, Clive Barker dot info revelations. Yes, yeah, that's a that's a good price, I guess. Uh, yeah. Fifteen dollars. I don't have it, that book, so I may even like go there and try to get it. Oh yeah, yeah. Go to um tor- go to the subterranean website and and uh, that's that's one of their. They've got a whole bunch of these humble bundles, and that that's the fifteen dollar one has has uh, tortured souls in it. Okay, or you can go to www.humblebundle.com. So. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, that's great news. Yeah, and I think what we've got coming up on the site, well, we've talked about a lot of it already. Our next episode after this one is going to be talking about uh, Infernal Parade and the 25th anniversary of The Thief of Always. And and Tortured Souls is a good companion to Infernal Parade, or the other way around, because yeah. these are uh, stories that came out with figurines. Yeah, so it really yeah. is. And and we'll explain a little more about that in our next uh, episode too, because I, I have some some thoughts on that. Okay, uh, excellent. And oh, you did a you on the on the website. You've uh, you've done um, some portraits by Stan Darkard. I think he's is he on um, on uh, what do you, uh, he's on Facebook. He has a Facebook called okay. Stan Dark Art, all oh, okay. separate words. And he also has a profile called Stan Dark Art. So if you look him up, I'm sure you'll you'll find him really easily. I think he's um he lives in LA. He's a Ukrainian artist and I think he has cerebral palsy. So uh he's worked with uh, uh artists like Paul Komoda, who who's done some work for like aliens and movies and stuff like that. So oh, wow. yeah, I, I saw that shared on Clive Barker's Twitter feed, uh, the portrait that he did. And I thought, hey, this looks pretty cool. So I shared it, and then I looked more into it. And I added Stan Dark Art on Facebook. And he immediately started sending me a bunch of art and saying, hey, this is great. You know, that's cool. Yeah, so I told him I was going to do a blog post, and I did an artist showcase on him. So it's on the blog. Uh, We've also started uh, doing a little of the work uh, transcribing the... the, um I think we talked. We may have talked about this on our last episode, transcribing the 
the interviews for our book. Um, yes. Yeah. Very boring, boring work. Very, very yeah. slow. Yeah. Um, you you put up your Undying Let's Play video number two. Um, mm -hmm. So check that out. If, if you haven't seen that game in a long time, and it's likely you may not have a, a machine or the, or the software to run uh, Undying anymore because it's a game from the 90s. Um, yes. So yeah, check that out. It's it's that's cool to to relive that. I I have the game, but I put it in my computer and it wouldn't run. It's practically a blind let's play because I honestly didn't look at the manual or anything mm -hmm. like that. I'm just playing it. Sometimes I forget the controls. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> and I get lost a lot in these two first episodes oh, because. Yeah. And then I discovered there's actually a map of the house and the grounds that you could print out. So I think I'm going to use that so I try not to get too lost in the game. Because I'm sure that if you, if anybody out there likes to watch Let's Plays, I'm sure that if they watch the second episode, they're going to be like, you moron, you have to go down the stairs and to the right and go into the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's like, I'm sorry, I'm just going upstairs or I should be going downstairs. And I was just like, huh, where do I have to go? So, yeah, it's true that nowadays games are a little more on rails sometimes. So it's, you know, basically it's just a nice big hallway and you just go through that and you just keep moving forward. But this one, you can get lost because there's a lot of rooms and a lot of going locked back doors. And forth and, yeah, and then now the room is unlocked. And I think yeah. my, my memory of that game is that everything gets better once you get the Tibetan War Cannon. Yeah, which I do, which <laughs> I do in second episode. And oh, I, I. I blow a lot of those like uh, squid creatures. Uh, I blow a lot of those up. But uh, oh, yeah, I I went all the way up to the standing stones. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can play some more and and keep posting parts of, you know the, the let's play for Undying. Uh, another thing, there's a certain audio book that we are previewing, and we don't want to say what book or who's reading it. We're gonna tease that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a Clive Barker book, and it's a new audio book uh, that we'll be talking about here in the near future. Oh, boy. I mean, I, 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 I want to talk about it so much. I know. Uh, <laughs> I was listening to a little bit of it yesterday. Oh, did you? Yes, yes. I got that from, you know, from Mark. And uh, I was just astonished. And I was like, wow, this is one of my favorite recent Clive Barker books. And so I think it's wonderful that uh, it's being turned into an audio book. Yeah, and we'll we'll have more on that later. We'll have an episode and probably a review. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that'll be that'll be coming pretty soon. We got a lot yeah. of stuff actually. We 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 uh, we've ended up having mapping out this whole like next six months of episodes already based on the Kickstarter and and uh, you know stuff that's coming out. This has been a, a big this has been a big February. It's been the big gray beast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a great, a great been, gray beast. Yeah, but uh, so I like, I like that. I like that all these projects are coming out, and that we're being able to to uh, get a chance to preview it and 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 offer some feedback. It's great. I mean, this is the fifth year of our podcast again, and thank you for all the Kickstarter supporters. And Kickstarter turned out to be a really good way to plan out the whole schedule. I mean, we used to our first couple of years were a little chaotic. I mean, we were. Yeah. I remember it was stressful when we were like doing an episode and then we were thinking, well, what should we do for next episode? Oh, yeah. You well, know, we started I mean, out with the books of blood because it's like, OK, well, there's our next like six to ten episodes all mapped out, you know. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But it was. But after that. Yeah, yeah. It was hard to do a, an episode of books of blood every other week. It's hard to get a whole book done in that amount of time. Also, what do you guys think about our new lineup schedule being kind of weekly, you know, alternating a news episode with a topic episode. And uh, it's, it's, it's a little more work. Uh, and at the same time, it's not because we record these things together and, you know, we, we release them separately uh, across the span of two weeks. But I think it's interesting um, that we're doing this and it, we're, we're becoming weekly instead yeah. of biweekly. And I would like to know if you guys agree with this, if this is too much for you or you, you would rather just have, just one big episode with like news in the beginning and a topic episode. Um, this gives us more flexibility on the format. So, yeah. you know, news that are more time sensitive, uh, they, they can be released quicker and we have more time to prepare topic episodes. Yeah. But, uh, so let us know what you think. Yep. And, uh, this podcast having no beginning will have no end. 
can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, Google Play, and Double Twist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.